Okay, welcome everybody. My name is TD. We are going to have a presentation on human mapping with machine data by Christopher and Eduardo from Mapillary. It's going to be a 20 minutes presentation and then five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. From the number one mapper in Africa. Nice introduction. So my name is Eduardo and I'm from Mapillary. This is Chris. Hi. And today we're going to talk to you about the topic of human mapping with machine data. So human mapping is really the core of why we're all here today for this conference. Mapping itself, uh, some would call it cartography, but there's also aspects of data collection, design, visualization, data management, many more ways to, to paint it. And in one way you could say it's symbols that help us make sense of the world. And it's something that goes very far back in human history. So I have here a cave painting. It's not a map. But this is a, a very famous piece of, um, of human symbology that helped us just kind of represent something uh, more real. And the map does something very similar for us. And one of the ideas behind all of this is symbols like this and maps or cartography are created by humans. And they're intended to be a tool that's also used by humans. Humans build these maps, but we also design them, we tweak the design, we test them, we try to break them, uh, even more so in the modern day when they get complex, they're web maps. Uh, we invent new ways of visualizing things, we imagine new ways of using the map, and we find all these tools that help enable us uh, to build better maps or to use maps better. And maps come from various sources. In a way, you could say all maps are built from data in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and the raw, uninterpreted data is the source of information like you might see in a change set comment on OpenStreetMap. So you can see the sources on this one are street level imagery, mapillary, aerial imagery, local knowledge, survey, GPS. All of these can be not so meaningful on their own. They take uh, some interpretation in order to turn them into a map, whether it's an image uh, from the ground, an aerial image, just a GPS point. It takes the human to actually transform that into some larger piece of information. So really, the human serves as the bridge between that raw data and the information that's derived from it. And in our case, that's in the form of a map. Okay, so we're pretty familiar with photo mapping in the context of OpenStreetMap now, but just to reiterate kind of how it's evolved, we're doing dense image capture now. So we're able now with a lot of the action cameras that are available to get up to, in some cases, if you're using a dash cam, five images per second. And so you can get almost every possible uh, object on the side of the road as you're driving through or cycling or walking. And so this is kind of what we're really pushing now is dense capture, whereas in the early days of OpenStreetMap when you saw people using photos in kind of using DSLR cameras, they were taking one photo of a garbage truck or a garbage can rather, moving to the next scene, taking another photo. Now it's about doing a field survey and then computers driving a lot of data and then us making that data available, which we'll talk about in a second. So you've got that geotagged image, you've got a timestamp, and they can compare across time. So in terms of the computer vision that's going on behind the scenes, so the algorithms are detecting, are using training data uh, that's collected, well, we're actually manually, manually annotating images, and that's done um, by humans. And then we are able to scale this once we actually have humans um, doing verifications, which, which we'll talk about in a second as well. So if you look at what's going on behind the scenes, so this is a fire hydrant detected across three different images, actually in this case seven different images, and it shows you which images have been detected. We're actually able to triangulate that using a 3D reconstruction that's taking place behind the scenes. So this is the fire hydrant viewed within Mapillary. You can see other segmentation, so there's light poles that have been segmented, traffic signs as well in many images, the street light. And we're able to do this because of that 3D reconstruction. And so we're talking earlier about dense imagery. The more dense imagery you have, the better this 3D reconstruction. And this is a very fast GIF, but that equates to 3D points on the map. So 
So if we look back at like how Mapillary's been involved with OpenStreetMap, we had a traffic sign layer available for a long time. This was one of the first things we did as far as making computer vision available for OpenStreetMap. And then shortly after that, it was available in Jossum. But the problem was we had map features. We had map features for a while, but they weren't actually available in OpenStreetMap. So we had like traffic signs, but not necessarily fire hydrants that we detected. So we started to ask ourselves, how can we make this data available? What, what data is useful for the community? What data is not? Um, and this was partly because we had a huge upswell of like community interest in improving our data. When there were traffic signs that weren't detected correctly, they wanted to be able to help us and improve that, um, and improve the, the recall rate of those signs. So earlier this year, we ran a project called Mapillary to OSM. It was a very like hacky project, but the idea behind it was to take some of this data that we had and make it available to OpenStreetMap. We didn't do it in a very elegant way. We thought we'd just do it as an experiment at first. And so what we did was chose five cities that had pretty decent coverage in a pretty strong community. So that was Austin in Texas, Ballarup in Denmark. We had Melbourne in Australia, Sao Paulo, and Kiev. And we downloaded data sets of things like crosswalks, streetlights, benches, and we made that available as just a, a Google Drive form that they could download um, and then load into OpenStreetMap as a GeoJSON. So 25 square kilometers of interest and three different types of map features, and then we tracked what they added to the map. <laughs> Wrong computer. Okay, great. So this is what it looks like. I don't know if you've, hands up if you've used a GeoJSON file in ID Editor or Jossum. So it's, it's kind of handy, but it's not interactive. So when you click on those um, pink squares, nothing happens. This is showing the 3D, the, the actual location of that sign as we've estimated it to be, but you don't know here which image it's been detected. So you might need to click around again uh, a lot to actually find it. So not the most elegant solution, but this was just step one. And we found in this particular case that benches were the most useful object. And one interesting finding was that benches identified in Ukraine were a lot more accurate than benches derived in Austin, Texas. So for whatever reason, our algorithms are better in Ukraine for benches. So in terms of the feedback that we've got from the data, not all the icons are intuitive. So we have a suite of icons that correspond to the different points. And to make mapping kind of as efficient as possible, someone needs to know when they're looking at, say, 50 different points that that's a street light, that's a garbage bin. I don't know if you've seen the icons on mapillary.com. Chris is going to show them later, but it's not always intuitive what they are. So that's one thing we can improve on. The lat long varies a lot. So in downtown areas like Melbourne, the estimation um, of, of a, a point can be far off because the actual GPS of the smartphone capturing it is all wild and all over the place. And the last feedback, I don't know if you met Henry yesterday, if you're at the Hot Summit, but he was using Mapillary in Kampala, Uganda. And he was telling us that a lot of the object classes that we have, things like crosswalks and uh, benches, they're not actually set up in mind uh, with Uganda in mind. So that's one thing we're trying to do, is get more training data from places like Kampala, and then that will probably change that scenario. And we can also add new object classes like windows, which are actually very important for humanitarian purposes and understanding earthquake resilience. So a similar project we worked on this year uh, was with four students from the University of Washington uh, in Seattle in the US. And we decided that we wanted to analyze an area that had dense mapillary imagery and therefore pretty dense data. So we picked uh, a section of Portland, Oregon, uh, known as the Pearl District, so it's a, a nice quadrant of the town. And what we wanted to do was take the data that Mapillary had detected and compare it to what was already on OSM to see what matched up, uh, as well as see what was valid data that could be added to OSM and improve it. And finally, see what data was either uh, a false negative or just a duplicate that wasn't actually useful in improving the map. So the specific project uh, was called Verifying Mapillary Point Features and Improving OpenStreetMap Data. And the total number of points that came out of Mapillary were just over 2,000. Uh, about 1,200 of these were actually visible in the photos. The other 900 were uh, some combination of either too small or blurred to be visible, at least to the human eye, which sometimes means it might still be there. It's just not easy to identify. Uh, other times, it was a false classification. So 
that rate would be about 59% um, were brought onto the next stage of actually analyzing for adding to the map. And so that cut down by a little less than half uh, to 452 points added to OSM. So the main classes you can see here, uh, they're very similar to ones that Ed mentioned previously. Uh, so we had benches, crosswalks, trash bins, fire hydrants, and bicycle racks. These we knew from previous tests were some of the uh, more accurate classifications. So we're not talking about spatial position accuracy, but just uh, having an algorithm find this in an image. And so these ones we selected specifically uh, to keep the tasks small, allowed them to evaluate this over the course of about six weeks. And also they were ones that translated very well into matching tags in OpenStreetMap. So we found quite a few of them had issues with false positives. Benches, for example, uh, when you're a machine and not a human that thinks uh, as critically as we do, you can classify it often very the same as things like guardrails, uh, cafe chairs and tables, like all these. Technically, you'd give the machine some leeway. That looks like a bench, but it's really not. So it wasn't useful in actually adding to the map. And waste baskets, very similar, a lot of confusion with similar shaped objects. Uh, bicycle racks, uh, just imagine what one looks like in the city or town where you live. And it's probably completely different if you travel somewhere a few hours away. Uh, there's no standardization of these visually, even though we have a standard tag for it in OpenStreetMap. So again, it can be confused with other things that are similar shapes. Handrails on stairs going into buildings. Uh, often was classified as a bike rack, and sometimes even had a bicycle attached to it. So this can, uh, this can be how the machine thinks, and we have to definitely have some, uh, some oversight on this. Uh, and crosswalks as well, just uh, white light in the photo or other pavement markings, a lot of these can cause issues. So they did a breakdown of the total detection rate, um, but you can see here from the percentages, just to sift through it, the bicycle racks actually performed pretty well overall, despite a few confusing ones. Uh, fire hydrants also were very consistently good, and crosswalks also were pretty useful. So what we were really interested in gleaning from this was what the drawbacks are, what our data is failing to do and where we can improve. We already see there's quite a few strengths, um, and that's what we wanted to focus on for getting that data into OSM. But we found it can be difficult to interpret the data, uh, especially if you're pulling it from an API, just trying to get GeoJSONs and limited quantities, you need to have a good way to import that into OpenStreetMap. So on our API, you put in a bounding box. Choose a square on the map, you'll get the data. Uh, but you need to filter it out. There's some data classes that aren't relevant, things that OpenStreetMap doesn't have a tag for, like a paint marking. So it becomes a lot of work just to get started before you're even in the editor. And finally, once you're in the editor, you're seeing that something is said to be detected as a point on the map. You can't find it in the image. So it's helpful if you can actually go through the imagery first and verify that it's really there or validate that it's what it says it is. So there's, uh, there was a lack of workflow for this. And so it really boiled down to how can we make this workflow exist? How can you ingest this type of data into OSM? So a next experiment. Uh, that came up was some kind of data overlay. We knew that we wanted to take certain point features and put them on the map. And we wanted to have it act in the way of a tile layer. If you're familiar with Mapillary from recent years on OpenStreetMap, you'll see traffic sign layer uh, available in ID and JOSM. And you can overlay it so you can find something like a speed limit. You'll know which road is adjacent to it and you can go ahead and add that uh, max speed as an attribute of the road. But we wanted to find a similar process for point features beyond traffic signs. So we had a sprite system created, so a set of icons, and we were able to associate these with the points and see what it looked like when you brought it in as a layer and ID. Uh, we were to filter out for just a few classes. Uh, we made it so Similar to our traffic signs, if you click the icon, it'll pull up images that are facing toward that, measuring off the camera angle. And it allows the mapper to then analyze where that data is located, like a traffic light in an intersection, inspect the images, verify exactly what it is, 
and then use their knowledge of OSM and the tagging system to go ahead and add it to the map. And we also filter out images or points that don't appear in at least three images. Um, so if, even if it's only two images, we don't consider that dense enough. So this is a really important reason to have lots of images in one area. And that really helps give evidence that the thing actually exists. So we ran a quick test with this, um, sent it to a few users. So one user in Japan provided very good feedback. Uh, you can see the map of the area he was looking at here. And the first thing he said is, I don't know what these icons mean. And these actually seem a little more intuitive when you see them larger, but on a small screen there's just a lot of detail. So we said, okay, well we need to have some more information about what exactly you're seeing on the map. We need to add that as a map key somewhere. Uh, it was also clear that like a lot of the data positioning was affected by the quality of the GPS, so it was offset. Um, a lot of false negatives, and of course there was no compendium of what actual data is available. So we came up with this slide right here just to make a con uh, concise list. Uh, this is one we'll tweet out later as well. Uh, just gives you an idea of what you can get on the map and what the icons look like. And we find this is a huge, uh, huge aid for people that want to know what they're looking at when they overlay that layer. So we have this available in a few test regions right now. Uh, so you can see the names of the regions here, including Heidelberg. Uh, we did some tests with users, uh, specifically just outside of Munich and Freising, uh, in a small area of Tokyo, and we also enabled the data in Ballerup, which is outside of Copenhagen. And then, mostly on my end, I was doing specific tests just looking at uh, the island of Madeira in Portugal, uh, the Galapagos Island, where we did a collaboration with a, a student mapping project, uh, as well as Zanzibar, where we had met with the Zanzibar M Mapping Institute last year, uh, and Ed and I had the chance to capture a lot of imagery in that area. So you can test it out. Uh, it's on the preview editor for OSM ID. So there's a URL at the top, just tiny.cc slash mapillary test. Uh, and this will allow you to see under the mapillary section of map data, uh, the map features layer. And you'll see in red there it says request data. If you click that, it's going to bring up a form. So just a quick look at it. You're going to draw a shape on the map where you want the data. We ask that you keep it small so it's very specific. Uh, we wouldn't expect you to be able to test out something like the entire country uh, of Sweden. So we will provide it to that shape and we just ask a little bit about who you are and what you're working on with it. Okay, so that ties in nicely to verification projects. So one of the drawbacks that you saw on the slide earlier was that often there are false positives, which means there's an object that Mapillary has said is there and it's not actually there. And so that's frustrating for OpenStreetMap is if they are actually downloading this data and then looking at it in ID editor and only 50% of the fire hydrants they click on actually have a fire hydrant there. And that's where the community comes in. Earlier this year, we ran a verification campaign where I think we had about, maybe Lindsay can correct me if I'm wrong, but about 50,000 verifications that took place. And now we're actually going for one million verifications. So what this means is we, we have a game where we have a set of classes. So here you, you can see the different kind of classes that we create projects for, um, things like birds, ground animals, crosswalks, planes. And if you're wondering like, why things like birds and ground animals come up when they're not related to OpenStreetMap, um, that's also helping us to remove things that aren't relevant. So crosswalks is one example. And what it looks like when it comes up is just a very simple image where you see the bounding box where we think this object is located. You can either give it a thumbs up if it's correct, thumbs down if it's not, and you can skip through them if you're unsure. And this goes into a leaderboard. And so what we're doing is 40 object classes. You can participate in the ones that interest you. And for the top three, the people who, once we reach one million, have had the most verifications, they'll receive one of these three prizes. So we're aiming for October 6th, which is uh, not too far away. But given the previous kind of feedback that we've had on this challenge, we think it's possible. But I think uh, the prizes should be pretty enticing. And we've made it now so that 
when you actually verify, it's not just you clicking yes or no, you actually have to have someone else confirm it in the same way that you did. So you can't just cheat the system and thumbs down to everything or thumbs up. Um, and you can't even have someone else, like you know, your friend, going through and pressing the same as you are, because um, we'll be scanning for that as well. So we're actually trying to create quality data. We don't want to be dumping um, bad data into OpenStreetMap. But if there is an area of, of interest to you that uh, you'd like to improve, this is how you do it. And so I guess the final point, if you participate in this, it's improving in two ways. One, it's removing false positives. So if there is, you know, you're trying to add bike racks in your city in Antwerp, you can go through, you can create a verification project, you can remove all the false um, bike racks that have been detected, and then you'll have a clean data set for OpenStreetMap. The second thing is it helps us, once we retrain our algorithms, to improve the recall for that object class. And so maybe you do it in Antwerp, but maybe someone else does it in Uganda, and then we'll have a, a global verification um, data set so that we can identify what a bike rack looks in many different scenarios across the world. So we'll skip through to... So, the last thing that we want to mention, um, so we're, we're going to wrap up pretty quickly now. But uh, so global verification project I've just mentioned. I think the other thing is we're really emphasizing dense capture now. So we have a series of capture tools um, which we'll be speaking about over the next few days, which is where if you have a team, you're trying to divide up where you're each going, you can assign tasks, a bit like the hot tasking manager, but for street level imagery. Uh, the other thing is we have this huge amount of data available from each image, but what is relevant? So we'd love to have this conversation with you about what map features you think are useful for OpenStreetMap and which ones aren't. If there are new features you'd like to have in, please let us know as well. And lastly, before we get to questions, we have a raffle um, that, that'll be taking place tomorrow in a birds of feather session yet to be announced, but follow us on Twitter where we will announce that, and we'll be giving away a GoPro and Harry from Hot Indonesia was the lucky winner yesterday. And you have to be there to collect the prize. I think there was three or four people who missed out um, because they, they weren't there. But he, he showed up and so he received the prize. So please do come along to the Birds of Feather session. We'll talk about street level imagery and how we're all using it. So thanks for coming to the session. And I think we'll throw it over to questions now. The enlightening presentation, Ed and Chris. Uh, I think you have moved way into the questions time. I will give you only two minutes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, quick questions, and then you can find us outside as well. We're always available. Hello. You were complaining about bad uh, GPS positioning. Are there an, any efforts of improving that but by just looking at the images? From that, you can actually determine the position, we're, we're at already, least in the city. Yeah, we're doing that with the 3D reconstruction. So we're, we're actually trying to realign the GPS positions. But you don't see that on the, when you look at the sequences on maplory.com, that's just showing whatever your phone recorded. But with the objects, we're actually trying to improve the, the 3D reconstruction. So we are doing that. I think we have time for one more. Okay, it looks like there are no okay. more questions, but if you have any questions, they, are, they have the green pin, so you can catch them anywhere and ask. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you.